Welcome to the Grow Your Business and Grow Your Wealth podcast with Gary Helt. Gary is an expert in helping business owners put together a plan that will provide a better future for their businesses, themselves, and their families. On the podcast, Gary interviews other professionals who share his vision, and together they share secrets and strategies any business owner can use to build a better financial foundation for your business and your life. Hi, this is Gary Helton. Today, I'm thrilled to bring you a special episode of Grow Your Business and Grow Your Well. My special host is Danny Bullock, and he will be interviewing his own guest that will be bringing us a information-packed and valuable insights on perspectives from other business owners that will resonate with you and help you grow your business and grow your well. I'm confident that you'll find this episode to be informative, inspiring. So let's dig in. Good day, everybody. I'm Danny Bullock, president of Dream Builder Financial Services, and I am guest hosting today. And my guest is David Fonts, who is the managing partner of CLA's Providence, Rhode Island, and New Bedford offices. Dave, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Danny. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited about this. Oh, good. Glad to have you uh, sit in with us for a little bit. Hey, Dave, give us a little bit about your background. So I am. I have the honor of being the the managing principal of both our Rhode Island and New Bedford offices. So just from my background, we provide accounting, tax, and advisory services to both what we like to call private individuals and private businesses. For the most part, uh, we are a full service provider. So we 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 handle the accounting, auditing, tax, and we have some things on the digital side as well that we assist a lot of our clients with. My background, I'm a lifelong Rhode Islander. So if you're mm. from the area, I've been here my whole life and I've really serviced businesses all throughout New England and, and throughout the country. And we have a lot with international operations. So we have, we're very well rounded as a firm, I feel overall. And then you're married with children? Two little ones. Yep. So I'm yeah. married. I have a three and a five-year-old. We actually just got back from vacation. So no. I'm still catching Busy. up. <laughs> yeah. But no, they, they, they take up when I'm not in the office, I'm just spending time with them. So it's, it's great. Let's jump in. And I want to just start really with your career journey. Could you share with us the journey and what led you to become the managing uh, principal at CLA uh, for Rhode Island and New Bedford? Yeah. So for me, for the most part, I would say this. So like I've started when I first started my career, I actually started out a small firm, a 20 person firm. And when I came out of college, I was like, what do I want to do? And I knew I had a passion for accounting. I know that might sound weird to some people. And I think we give the pro account profession a bad label, but it's really a great profession where you get to interact with businesses, you learn what businesses do. And I went to a small firm initially to get a feel of what I wanted to do because it gave me the options to explore different things. But as I progressed, we were going through multiple mergers and an opportunity came for me to take on this role as a managing principal. And I'm just passionate about the area. I'm passionate about the profession and I'm passionate about the overall business community we have here in Rhode Island. So I was very passionate about taking this role because it really mm. gave me the opportunity to touch more businesses, touch more people, be even more involved in the community. At CLA, we really concentrate on our people, our community, right? How do we create those opportunities for those and our clients as well? So to me, it was just a great role because uh, I love the role. I love being involved. The more clients I can touch, the more people in the communities I can touch, right? And the more of my people I can interact with, the better. So I was all for really this progression. So when I got the opportunity, it rose, my hand went right up and said, I'll take it. Wow. Wow. Well, and and you aren't, you know, really old, you're, you're older, but you took the position as at a relatively young age for someone in this position, right? Yeah. It was a great opportunity. I think, what do they say about opportunity? You got to be as preparation and some of it's luck, but I yeah. think I worked towards this. So I think what comes through and I'll, share this advice with anybody. There's only a few things you can control in your life, but you can always control your effort and the work mm. you go forward. So if you show that passion, you put that work into it. And I think that's really helped me throughout my career that I show that passion. I show the eagerness to it. I wouldn't let age be a barrier of any of your career opportunities, right? It's really, do you yeah. have the expertise? Do you have the know-how? Can you connect with people? So I always stress that, those type of things. And willingness to take on a challenge. You said you put your hand up and you accepted the challenge and you're doing well at it. So that's good advice. Yeah. Really good advice. I always joke around. I have the, the I guess the young, I'll say the younger people, like we're, we're older, but the, <laughs> the, the whole term of FOMO, like the fear of missing out. I really mm. do have that. I love being involved with stuff, but at the same time, you always got to take a step back and say, all right, 
can, if I'm going to commit to this, can I truly commit to it? Because you never want to overcommit to something that you can't. Yeah. So I, I always take that in mind when I, when I step up for these roles. Hmm. Hmm. That's great advice. Let's look at some of your professional insights. So as a CPA and as CFE with the MBA, how do you integrate uh, your diverse experience and expertise to provide comprehensive solutions to your clients? So before I get started, I, I forgot I have to do a quick oh, disclaimer yeah. <laughs> that my commentary because now we're, we're out of the personal stuff. So before I get started, I need to do a quick disclaimer that my comments today are intended as just general information. Don't constitute any specific financial accounting or legal advice. So with that said, I think the more well-rounded you are as an individual, the better advisor you can be. I think the CPA, to be honest, is a gold standard. Not that we need more CPAs, but I'm going to say the CPA profession, I think, is a gold standard because it prepares you to be so well-rounded. So given my client base, I felt being a CPA, and especially if you're in public accounting, that's the way to go. And I suggest anybody who's in the accounting industry, even if you're non-public, become a CPA. Mm. It really stands for the coolest profession around. It's not so, <laughs> kind, right? so I took that for one of my colleagues, so I'm not going to own that one. We'll give you credit but, for it now, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think it gives you such a great foundation for business. I've seen so many businesses throughout my career. It gives me a way that it's what, what works for this business. What doesn't work for this business? Is mm. it applicable to you? Obviously, every business, different facts and circumstances. But having that CPA designation has given me the opportunity to kind of provide that type of assistance. From the certified finance uh, fraud examiner standpoint, fraud is prevalent in our world today, right? Whether yeah. it's cyber, it really gives you the tools to better advise people. It gave me the tools to say, if I'm helping somebody out with the fraud issue, I really have a foundation to do so. So it's given me things that I would look at. It gives me another perspective that I look at where I can assist clients on that end of stuff. So I think having both really, especially what we call the accounting and insurance side of our business, it really mm -hmm. gives me a better mindset to really go in and be partners and help our clients. They're just not getting a CPA. You have that fraud experience as well. So, yeah. you know, speaking of the clients and just looking at the industry and some of the challenges that some small businesses face, you know, what are some of the biggest financial challenges that you see the small businesses facing? And what are some of the things they can do to mitigate those effectively? I think you got to understand, like, you have to understand your data, right? You have to understand what are your winners and losers. I think a lot of people look at their business holistically, which is great. Like, am I making money? And, and that's usually a good indicator, right? Do I have a strong balance sheet? Mm. Am I generating a profit month after month? The next step to that is really, are you digging down in the details to see who are your winners and losers? So like, I, I have some a fair amount of clients in the manufacturing industry and where we say, all right, what products are you generating that makes you money? What products are you generating that you're not making money? So having that level of understanding so you can be nimble. The other thing I would say is like timely information. A lot of times in our profession, we're looking at things historically. So we're looking at like a month ago, like two mm -hmm. months ago, right? But if you could have that real-time information, I think those businesses that have that real-time information are more nimble and can make faster decisions. So when I see some of the things that would help them along those paths is just having that access to data and make sure that data is right and you can work on it to kind of improve your business throughout. All right. All right. So what I want to do is that I want to have you put on your CPA hat for me and we'll, we'll do the uh, fraud examiner in a second. But, you know, from a CPA's perspective, what are some key indicators that a business is financially healthy? I would say a couple of things, right? There's some things you want to look at what we call our current ratio. You want to make sure you have a good spread between that. So that's whatever your current assets are. So that'll be stuff like cash. Mm -hmm. If you're in the manufacturing industry, it'll be like inventory or anything that is inventory based. That's very liquid. And do you have enough to cover what's ever your current liabilities? What are those current expenses that you got to pay throughout? So that's a good indicator. At the end of the day, cash is king too, right? You mm -hmm. want to make sure you have the cash on hand because that drives a lot. And you always got to look at your leverage. So if you need assistance, make sure that you're not overcommitting to the debt that you have, that you can pay the debt and meet your obligations. Mm -hmm. So when I look at that, those are some things on a balance sheet perspective. You want to make sure you're profitable each month. You want to make sure you understand who your winners and losers are. You got to understand your costs because once costs get out of control, it might be too late. Oh. Business struggle with that. They have to take on more debt to finance the cost and it perpetuates. So it's important to get an understanding of your cost structure. I think every business should understand that break even point. I have to generate X amounts of revenue to cover this amount of cost. So having that sense of understanding what your fixed costs and variable costs all go into it. So I always say control is money in, money out. Right? Make sure you know where your money's going, right? Mm -hmm. Understand where you're where your profitable, where your expenses are going. 
And once again, like I said before, cash is king. Make sure you understand how your cash is flowing throughout the operation. All right. And just, you know, in when I'm dealing with individuals and their personal finances, basic rule of thumb for cash, we usually like to say, you know, uh, depending on where you are in life, anywhere between six and 12 months of uh, living expenses, you know, have liquid in an account that you can get a hold of. Is there a rule of thumb when it comes like that for business owners? It's it's tough. It, it's, it's all facts and circumstances. You want to make sure you have enough to cover your costs. Like it's very dynamic. A lot of people have these receivables to set up. So you understand what I would say is understand your collection period. If you're okay. a business that you work on, you, you send invoices out, you get paid 30 days later or, or 60 days, depending on what your terms are, make sure you have enough on hand to cover your immediate expenses. Like if you're a business that like you expect that your customers pay you every 30 days, right? Then you want three or four months out mm. enough to cover that. But I would say, depending on how you how cash comes in, you want to make sure it matches the way cash comes out. Because then that's when you get into like, I got to take on more debt. I'm paying yeah. interest on this debt. And that's not a bad thing. I don't mm -hmm. want to say that is necessary sometimes to fund timing differences. Mm -hmm. But you want to make sure that you can manage that debt. You just don't want that debt to continue to grow, grow, grow. Then it becomes something that becomes an issue in the future. So I would say like, based on your business, understand what your turn is. And based on that turn, it might be, it might be you want to keep three months on hand. It might be yeah. six months, it might be 12. It's all facts and circumstances of your business. Okay. All right. So we got the CPA's perspective. Now I want to go to the, you know, CFE, the fraud, uh, certified fraud examiner's perspective. You know, and when we look at fraud prevention, what common vulnerabilities, you know, from a small business's perspective, do you often identify as problems and, you know, they find themselves being vulnerable to. And what are some preventive measures that you would recommend? So I know I wish we, everybody could hire a huge accounting staff to take <laughs> care of everything so they can track stuff. And a lot of these don't have the resources to do so. And a lot of time there's one person who's doing so much of the things, whether they're so much functions that they have an opportunity for fraud because there's mm -hmm. no oversight. And a lot of small business owners, oh, I trust, I trust Bobby. I trust Susie. She's been with me 20 years. She would never mm -hmm. steal from me. And yeah. in a lot of those instances, uh, they do happen. steal. Yeah. Yeah. It does happen because you have that, there are things you can do there. Like I understand everybody trusts everybody, but like mm -hmm. sometimes there's motivation to steal. Sometimes things could happen to yeah, that. Circumstances, area. right? So what I would say is this, there's some key controls. Make sure as an owner, you understand where your cash is how it's coming in. If you have late customers, make sure why customers are not paying in because you don't want a situation where somebody took a payment for themselves rather than coming into the company. So understand your, how your cash comes in. Understand how your cash comes out. Make sure you're approving checks over a certain dollar amount. Like you, you know who your vendors are. Mm. And your vendors make sense. So there's oversight. When you're a small business like that, there really needs to be owner oversight over the management team by the owner. If it's really like a small business where he's looking at those things going in and out that he's reviewing stuff. What I always say is good to have and is have a budget or make sure you're looking at budget to actuals. Like here's mm -hmm. what the actual, here's my budget. Is. Then you investigate things that go out of budget. So those are some small controls you can put in that makes, does a huge difference. Especially, mm -hmm. I know we're very paperless in this paperless world. Yeah. But just make sure you're reviewing those transactions. Even if you're reviewing your bank statements on a, on a monthly basis as an owner, just so you understand where's my cash in cash in cash out and ask questions. Mm. Don't assume, ask those questions, ask for support. Because the best preventive measures when you have a small structure is the oversight yeah. from the owner. You have to be involved in the operations in terms of that stuff. So trust, but also verify, right? Yeah, trust, but verify. That's a good <laughs> way to put it, right? <laughs> I've seen it a lot. So one of the uh, biggest needs I will often find small businesses ha have is they always want to find a way to cut taxes. They, Danny, I'm paying too much in taxes. Is there something I can do about taxes? So looking at tax strategies, you know, what are some effective tax strategies that small business owners often overlook, but they should consider? I would say, so every, I'm gonna preface this, every circumstance is different, right? You should really make sure you have an advisor that understands your business. The biggest thing, make sure you have an advisor there who understands your business. Because mm. there's a lot of opportunities based on your business based on industries, there's a lot of things going on with the tax code that you, that people can take advantage of to make sure your advisor's up to date on your business and they know you. There's available credits based on industries. Even with this Inflation Reduction Act that's fairly new, there's a lot of opportunities for even nonprofits to benefit from that. So I would say you have to be proactive and you can't just wait to, the, the biggest thing is what happens is people wait to December to try to do all the tax planning. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's too it's, late. <laughs> a little too it's late. Too late. You got to really <laughs> check in, like even on, with your advisor on a quarterly <laughs> basis. You can buy this equipment. Mm. But in reality, if you're going to buy a sizable piece of equipment, it's going to take you time to get it in, and you're probably not going to get in before the end of the year. So it needs to be. You need to be strategic with it. You got to be early and often, and you got to look throughout the year at checkpoints because it. You got to. I think a lot of times people don't think of how long is it going to take me to be tactical with it. Meaning, like, can I implement this? Yeah. yesterday or, or tomorrow or the next day you can't it, mm. sometimes it might take a month to implement it so it's important that you don't wait to the very end of the year you're very proactive throughout the year because there's, there's various things people can do whether certain timing certain purchases changing basis of accounting or even if there's some credits that you can take advantage of so there's various things that people can do throughout the year but they need lead time to do so yeah and especially if you don't have a retirement plan there's some things you can do on time plans but i would preference it like you got to have a trusted advisor who understands your business and they can really advise you a catch all I can give, but it's mm-hmm. really having those relationships, the people you trust, the people who can advise you throughout because we're very dynamic. We're in a very dynamic world. Yeah. So you want that advisor to be able to be dynamic with you so you can implement things on a timely basis. You don't want to, mm-hmm. I don't want to be sitting here and you, there's a joke around the accounting community around accelerated depreciate on like heavy SUVs. Mm-hmm. You don't want them to say, call them up. Go buy an Escalade on <laughs> December 30th. December 30th. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you guys can get title and take ownership of it. And that's not what it's it's really, it's really being proactive with your planning. Just don't mm. wait till December. Talk to your advisors throughout. And it's important like, to have all your advisors connected. Like, if you, yeah. if you have a CPA, make sure you have your financial advisor because we're all working to our common goal for our clients. So having that continuity and connection is very important as well. Yeah. Having a good financial team to talk to uh, each other is a blessing for all of us. It makes all of our yeah. jobs easier. So you were talking about checking, and I just want to quickly ask, and don't know if it's a rule of thumb or something that you can kind of give a little advice on. What is What would you think would be the recommended amount of time you would check in with your CPA? Is this a monthly thing? Is this a quarterly thing? It depends. If you're a business, I would try to check in at least quarterly basis, depending mm. on the assistance you need and what kind of relationship you have with your CPA. But I think always a quarterly gives you a good sense at a minimum because it gives you you have three months you can look at how did it go. And it also depends on what you, go, you have going on. If you have special projects in, bring them right away. A lot of times mm. you have clients that have special projects. I'm thinking about acquiring a company or I'm thinking about selling off a piece of my company. Get them involved right away. Don't, yeah. just don't wait for that. So like those would come as but just having that quarterly check-in goes a long way because then yeah. everybody's up to date. Then your advisor can, can, can come to you with some, some solutions that you might have not thought of. I think having an advisor is important because it gives you an outside perspective. Mm-hmm. A lot of these business owners, they're very operational based. They know how to grow their business, but they're so concentrated on that piece of it. They might not be seeing something that an advisor can bring to light to them. So I think it's important to really have those check-ins. So at a minimum, I would say like at least on a quarterly basis, I would check in with your advisors. Right. Hopefully your advisor is proactive enough to reach out to you to say, let's meet. Yeah, and they should be looking for another advisor. But you were just talked about business owners concentrating on growing their business. And I want to stay with that. How can small business owners better prepare their finances to support growth and scaling opportunities? So you got to make sure you understand your data and where you're profitable or not. Because I think you can be profitable at a certain level, but you want to make sure it's scalable. So you mm-hmm. understand that you have to almost have a foundation to understand, right? Here's how I am right now. And if there's variability, if I double, can I support that? Do I have enough people in there? So it's really those sensitivity models that you would like to build out for yourself. And there's advisors that can help you build it out. But that gives you really an insight because say you produce 10,000 widgets a year, that costs a certain amount. But if I go up to 30,000, do I have the manpower to even do that? So there's things there that you have to look at to make sure you want to prepare yourself to grow. So you need a foundation. So make sure you understand from a property standpoint, what are your winners and what are your losers? Mm. Then if you were to increase your winners or decrease your losers, what impact that would have? So what we like to call that is like a sensitivity analysis. And that's something an advisor can help you with because when you scale, I think a lot of times you see businesses grow. What's the point of growing if you're not not making money? Yeah, yeah. You you could be a hundred million dollar company, but if you're losing two, three million still, what what good is that? Wouldn't you rather be like a $5 million company that Mm. drops a million dollars? So just don't think about growth top line. Think about growth all throughout your whole financial, whether it's, am I generating profit with this growth? Hmm. All right. Just, and I looking at financial advice, you, you've given us a lot to digest, but 
I want to just ask this, and I don't know if it's one piece of advice, but you know, what advice do you find yourself repeatedly giving to small business owners? And I don't know if that's one thing, one piece of advice, or is there a couple of things that you repeatedly find yourself advice giving to business owners? I would say same thing. It's I'm gonna sound like a repeating drum and every everything's facts and circumstances based on that business. But you gotta make sure you understand your costs, right? Mm. Because costs can put you out of business, right? So understand your costs and don't overcommit. You always mm. have to control your costs, right? You gotta make sure you have the revenue to support those costs. So it's important that you understand your cost structure and how things might change, right? There's always unexpected things to happen, right? Maybe people with the workforce, the labor market could be tough, right? It's really understanding how sensitive your cost structure is and having that visibility in real time. A lot of times the importance <laughs> of having timely information is important. Mm. You can't mm. make decisions without good information. Yeah. So if I'm just closing out my books once a year, how do you know what you did? You're just going off a of feeler to say, oh, my cash was okay. And I'm okay. Mm -hmm. But you really need that monthly look to see how am I doing? And the sooner you can get those numbers, the better, because you, you can make educated decisions. For those individuals who don't have a sense until the end of the year, it's hard to make educated decisions. So if you have that data and that information, and there's tons of ways you can do it. You can have a trusted advisor that can help you with that. There's technology advances here that now make things easier in terms of automation that you can use. But that just gives you real-time information to make real-time decisions. I think the frustration a lot of times is we're making decisions absent of all the information or the information was from three months ago and how valuable is that? So the way, if you can get your information sooner, I think it puts you in a better position to make better decisions and really and, have a, a sense of control. And I imagine that advice is for all businesses of all sizes. You don't need to be a $10 million a year business to take that advice, right? No, yeah, it's, it's applicable to all sizes. It's just the best practice. The sooner you can get information, the more readily available it is the better decisions you can make like if we were buying a house then if i just went in the house i just looked at it i didn't do an inspection i didn't do all these things to get all my research on it i wouldn't be able to make as good as a decision if i did all that research on it and, and that information was like i could get it like today mm -hmm. so the sooner you can get real-time information it's better than making real-time decisions okay good last question and this is more of a career uh, driven question. If you're looking at this video, if you're listening to it on one of the streaming platforms, you might not notice, but if you're looking at the video, uh, you would notice that me and Dave are minorities and we're in the finance industry. Dave, just real quick, what advice would you give to minorities who are pursuing, pursuing different industries about looking at the finance industry and how rewarding it's been for you? It's a, I think it's a great industry. It's very rewarding. Like if you put the time in with any profession, I'd say like, there's only so much you can control. We, we all come from different backgrounds, right? And we have different experiences than the people we work with. But at the end of the day, if you can show those few things, especially when you first start out, I remember starting out, I knew nothing yeah, about yeah. accounting. I went to school, I was like, first day on the job, I was like, this is not what I learned in school. Cause it, it's so the real life application is so mm -hmm. different in some instances. Some instances it's not. But what I always told myself, and I, this came from my father, so my father immigrated to the U.S., so he, I'm a first-generation American when he came. Oh, wow. What he told me, and it stuck with me, is like, the only thing you control when you first start is your effort, right? Mm -hmm. the, you might not know everything, but you can put the time in, you can put the hours in, you can work hard, and, you, and somebody's paying you to work hard, so work hard. So I've mm -hmm. always got the mindset of, even if I don't know anything, I'm going to put the effort in, I'm going to put my hand up, and I'm going to put my hand up for opportunities. Because I think the more times you put your hand up, mm -hmm. the more experiences you have, the better you are as a professional. Yeah. So I always went off of that. In retrospect, one thing I wish I always did too when I first entered the profession is ask questions. Like I'm a prideful person and a lot of mm -hmm. times you're like, I'm going to figure this out myself. And sometimes you got you need that sweat equity. But when I first started, I spent like two hours on something that could have, if I asked a question, could have been resolved in five minutes. So <laughs> it's important when you're first starting off yeah. when you get into this profession, ask all the questions you need because those questions will build you. In the, in the future, you'll ask less questions. So I've always gone at it like that. Like no matter what my circumstances is, I'm going to work hard and I'll ask those questions because I think it, it, it shows the passion because a lot of times you need that passion rather because there's not a book what control what you can control. That's what I've always said. And there's resources too that you need help. There's a community. Hopefully, we'll start building out, especially around this community, in terms of some young professionals and, and minorities, and that we're building on this. Absolutely. I would love to see the, the profession way more diverse than it is right now. Yeah. 
and it's rewarding and you know you make pretty good money too you could find yourself <laughs> yeah you do right <laughs> it's a great we need more it's a great profession like us I'm, I'm gonna do a plug for my profession but like accounting <laughs> you're not just sitting in a cube at a public mm. account firm you're not just punching away at numbers you're really going into the field you're seeing all these different businesses what they're doing you're interacting with people you're learning about the business you learn how they make money you learn how they lose money you see what works well for them so what i would say with public accounting is you see a lot of it you see a lot of a business and how different businesses interact and if you're a person who wants to be out go different places even if you want to travel there's tons of travel opportunities too that you travel to these different businesses not just locally you can go internationally you can go nationally whatever your passion is with a career in public accounting, you have all those avenues open to you. So we're the worst at promoting what you do as a, I think, in public accounting. So I'm trying to work on that, even at local level, to say that this is mm. a great profession and get exposure to all these different avenues. So. Wow. David, I want to thank you for your time and joining us today. Wealth of knowledge. Thank you for just sharing that with us. And we appreciate it. I am going to put his contact information, David, you don't mind. That's going to be in the notes. You, know, you have some questions. Maybe you want to follow up on some of the things that he said for your specific situation. We're going to put his information in the show notes and you can reach out and talk to him. Dave. Yeah, please. Kai. I love talking to the people. I love being in the community. So please reach out no matter the size. You're not too big. You're not too small for us. Just come by. You may talk. I'm always open to a conversation. I'm always willing to talk to everyone. So, hey, there you have it. Dave, thank you again. Thank you guys for joining us. Till next time. All right. Thanks. Thanks. 49 faces looked to him in triumph. Over the last 12 months, they had each taken turns and promoted his business for a week at a time, driving over $987,342 in revenue. What if you had a network of 50 centers of influence who promoted your business every week for a year? Grab your copy of the number one Amazon best-selling book, The Ultimate Guide to Growing Your Business with a Podcast, at 33% off the Amazon price by going to ultimatepodcastbook.com. Again, that website for 33% off the Amazon price is ultimatepodcastbook.com.